CO2 emissions um, are now sort of unavoidably going to go up by another third in the next 20 years. And this quote is putting hopes of curtailing dangerous climate change beyond reach, end of quote. Now, this you would have thought was really quite remarkable that an oil company actually admits this. But the news was on the economics page. It wasn't seen as a major news story. The International Herald Tribune, uh, sorry, International New York Times then two weeks ago actually did put two stories on the front page next to each other. One said, one was on the latest report on, on the climate ch change saying the situation is now getting so serious that we need some drastic changes if we're going to have a chance within the next five years. And next to it was a report saying that the EU has now decided to cut down its climate funding, its renewable energy support, it's reducing its uh, climate goals because of short-term you know, concerns about short-term profitability and this is all you know, costing, costing too much. So I might say that this is a political failure. It's of course also the greatest imaginable market failure, as, as Nicola Stern already said years ago. And it's a sign of, I would say, moral and intellectual bankruptcy. So what, you know, what do we do about it? I mean, some people say, well, it's really too late. My, I, my, my experience, my experience is not too late, but it's very, very late. We've wasted a lot of time, so we need to take very drastic action, I think, in the next few years, which many people, of course, say, well, that's impossible. So you know, the situation is basically hopeless. And that's, again, you know, the case, because the solutions are actually, are actually there. We have done a number of studies in the World Future Council about 100% renewable energy regions. Now, you could actually fuel these regions with 100% renewable energy. There are a number of examples all over the world that this could be done if the political will was there, because uh, political will, of course, instantly changes reality. In, when uh, uh, Churchill feared that Britain was going to be attacked by Nazi Germany, he called up his friend Roosevelt and said, you know, I have basically nothing to defend the country with. I need so many thousands of planes and ships within, you know, a very short time. And uh, Roosevelt called together U.S. industry captains and said, you know, this is what I need. They say, well, this is impossible. They said, well, I give you, he said, I give you 10 days to change your mind and show me how to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to nationalize a lot of you. And of course, <laughs> they came and they did it. And we you know, with Two years, the U.S. was producing more um, ships, Liberty ships, planes than anybody two years previously had ever, you know, thought possible. So it is possible, but at the same time, of course, there's no guarantee. The German philosopher Hans Bloch once wrote that the price of human free will, of human freedom, is the the danger, the risk that the the great historical moment may encounter too small a human race humanity, you know, not up to the, the challenge. And that's, of course, up to us to prove that that is not the case, because we are the most powerful generations who have ever lived. We are the trustees of all future life on Earth. The decisions we take, and of course that also uh, includes the non-decisions we take, will have effects for, for good or bad for geological time frames. So how will we Act. Will we leave it, as many people, middle-aged or older people, now say, well, you know, we've failed, so leave it to the children, leave it to the next generation. But of course, that may well be too late. I think that is a shocking statement of responsibility, but also we have to realize, as my friend Herbert Girard says, we are on a collision course with our own future. The problem is that this future is rushing backwards to meet us. They used to be studies on effects of climate change, and they said this is going to happen in millennia, it's a question of thousands of years, and suddenly it became centuries. Then it became decades, and then people started talking about, well, this may happen within years. And then um, one of, a member of the World Future Council, when I was saying this, you know, Tony Coleman, called out and said, months. I said, you know, what do you mean? He said, well, my daughter, this a few years ago, mm -hmm. has, just, he has been working for 10 months uh, in a hotel on the South Island of New Zealand, and she's noticed the major, the big glacier above the hotel. She noticed how it has moved and melted in the 10 months that you know, she's been there. It was been uh, so fast and so clear. And of course, climate change, which everybody talks about, is not our only big challenge. You know, you've got biodiversity collapse, you've got the 
acidification of the oceans. There was an American expert at the conference I heard last week, Jeremy Jackson, one of the top American ocean experts, who said this is it's much worse than what's happening to the forests. The amount of ocean floor, which we've just cleared, but there's nothing left. The amount of overfishing going on is absolutely horrific. And we'll, in order to do something now in time, we have to basically reduce the fishing fleets by 65%. Now, of course, people say, oh, that's going to reduce 22 million jobs. But I mean, that's not the case. If you just take out the big fishing boats, which are doing almost all the damage, those affected will be, will be you know, much, much fewer. And um, we have now also got you know, ocean acidification, worse than it has been for, according to some people, 800,000. Other people say you know, since 20 million years. And of course, you've got uh, coming resource constraints. There are people in the mining business, for example, who just read at this growth rates predicted when the economy is going to run again. And they say, but the resources just aren't there. Chandra Nair, who's looked at this in some detail from the Global Institute for Tomorrow in Hong Kong, said there is no way that China can ever have the per capita resource consumption, even of Taiwan, much less of Belgium or the USA. And the Chinese government is aware of that. I mean, Chandra Nair is advising them, and of course they are trying to find another way out. But of course this is not the daily message which our infotainment society provides. Uh, in, in many ways are parallels to the end of the Roman Empire where people just didn't acknowledge the barbarians at the gates. And of, of, that, of course, was followed by then centuries of barbarian rule. But um, the civilization which Rome represented was kept intact, according to many studies, at the so-called Celtic fringe, in monasteries of the Celtic fringe of Europe until it then, over the centuries, trickled down back into Central Europe again. But of course, the problem is today the challenge is global. So there is no Celtic fringe. The Celtic fringe is us. Only we can, you know, we can do something about this. What can we do? I think, first of all, we need to face up to the very inconvenient truth that the, the daily reality of the media, of our politicians, has less and less to do with the reality of the world we actually live in. Lack of understanding of the interconnectedness of many problems, they all seen in, in isolation. So when the World Future Council started its work, we found to our amazement, there was no study about the interconnections between the climate threat and the nuclear arms threat and the threat of water, drinking water disappearing. And if you reflect on it, I think uh, Pakistan, is an unstable country with nuclear weapons, is dangerous enough. But if you consider what would happen in Pakistan when the glaciers have melted and there's no more drinking water. Now, of course, any patriotic Pakistani general would use the nuclear threat and say, take 50 or 100 million Pakistanis in the industrialized countries, which have caused the problem, or, you know, we're going to bomb you. So if you reflect, if you look a bit in the, f in the future and you look at this sort of immigration debate going on in Europe today, you realize, again, the complete disconnect with reality. There is a complete lack of understanding of risk hierarchies. The German sociologist Ulrich Beck has been you know, writing a lot about this. For example, the idea that you know, economics comes first. Now, of course, you can negotiate any economic, an economic crisis. You can negotiate with financial debtors. You can refuse to pay. You can agree to defer debts. You can do very many things. But, um, Melting glaciers and um, spreading deserts don't negotiate. It provides no rescue packages. So you know, it's a different scenario. There's also a lack of understanding that, of course, our economies depend on a healthy environment. You, know, you can't eat money. Unfortunately, our political leaders are advised by economists and believe economists to basically believe that you can eat money. Now, this isn't a joke. The uh, Herman Daly, an American economist who won the uh, Right Laddard Award, who has written about steady state economics, how an economic system can function without you know, steady growth. These prominent Anglo Saxon economists, politicians listen to and defer to, what do they say about climate change? Like William Nordhaus, a famous American you know, climate economist. Uh, Thomas Schelling, who won the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics, etc., and they basically say the same thing. Now, climate change will only, as far as we can see so far, seriously affect agriculture. 
Now agriculture in a country like the USA is about 3% of GDP. So even if that collapsed by 50%, it would be 1.5% growth less. Well, you know, we could compensate that somewhere else. So they actually seriously believe that if we just produce enough iPods and computers, it doesn't matter that food production is collapsing. And then you have the shocking case of Lawrence Summers, who again daily had this experience with him. Summers, when they were together at the World Bank for a short period, produced a publication in which the, the natural environment was in a diagram as a subsystem of the human economy, you know, a box in a box. And Daly said to Summers, but of course, you know, it's the other way around. I mean, the, our you know, uh, economy is completely dependent subsystem of our natural environment. And Summers said no and refused to change this diagram. And if you consider that Lawrence Summers has been the chief economic advisor to two US presidents, and not to Bush, but to Clinton and Obama, he's been the chief economist of the World Bank, he's been the president of Harvard University, where he still teaches. I mean, four of the most important positions you could have in the world. And this man actually believes something, which I would suggest isn't just that we disagree with it. It's on par with the belief that the Earth is flat. It's literally completely mad. You know? There is also, connected with that, a lack of understanding of what economic growth actually means. The Club of Rome report you know, talked about limits to growth. Well, of course, they were really talking about what limits to economic growth. And what has happened now, what has replaced economic growth, is uneconomic growth, a term again coined by <laughs> Herman Daly, eating up the very foundations of growth. Because the real problem is, of course, what do you do in the future uh, where resources are limited. Now the same cement, the same labor, you, if you have to use that to build walls to protect your dikes against rising sea level levels, you can't use the same resources to build dikes. <laughs> Here are where the real challenge has come, the real alternative. Of course, our leaders prefer to you know, put their height from this. They prefer to listen to people like the Danish statistician Lundberg. Now, Lundberg very clearly deny the climate change is going to be rich enough in future to cope with it because economic growth is going to make us richer and richer. So he actually says, and this is a man, you know, in foreign affairs had the review, the anniversary of the Club of Rome report, they give this man the last word. You look in papers, especially in, in England, for example, the, financial, uh, the Sunday Times, giving a page and a half. He very cleverly he understands he never agrees to debate anymore. Or not, he did in Australia recently, but not really in Europe because he knows that you know, he'd soon be shown to be a, you know, a complete buffoon. Now, he seriously said in, this, in, in a recent article, yes, Bangladesh in 100 years will be flooded. But you see, if you look at the GDP growth rates of Bangladesh and, and calculate those you know, over 100 years, Bangladesh will then be as rich as the Netherlands is today. So, of course, they can afford to build enough dikes to protect themselves. Now, of course, long before that, you know, Bangladesh growth will have collapsed because of growing you know, climate change. But this is a kind of you know, belief they have. So that it's, I can give you very, very frightening statements from people who know something about climate change. Now, Lord Giddens, who was the head of the London School of Economics, who wrote the book, The Politics of Climate Change, said um, about one and a half years ago at a, at a conference I attended that there is a serious risk that within this century, runaway climate change, positive feedback mechanisms, can make the Earth un. But fortunately, not all climatists, not all climate scientists are as pessimistic as that. But what's really worrying, I suggest, even more worrying, is the optimists, that these are people like Lomberg, and those are the people our, you know, our leaders still, still believe in. Again, connected, of course, is a lack of understanding of money. Now, so we have now in, in, in Europe and all over the world, you know, artificial austerity. And austerity, of course, used to mean that there was a real shortage. Now, during the last war, Britain had austerity because, you know, there was a real shortage of resources because they had to go into the war effort. Now we have a completely artificial austerity. There are huge underutilized reproductive resources. There are hundreds of millions in the world of unemployed people, but they can't be put to work because there's supposed to be a lack of money. The World Future Council's latest study has looked at the costs of this austerity, the unused productive capacities, which we are wasting. And you know, it's billions of dollars a year. And, uh, of course, as far as there being a lack of money, John Maynard Keynes said, 
whatever a society can do, what it has the resources to do, the labor to do, the knowledge to do, the technology to do, it can also finance. Anything else is nonsense, it's what I call you know, monetary fetishism. Then the excuse, of course, is, well, you know, the markets have to decide. But, you know, as Amory Lovins, the US uh, energy uh, efficiency pioneer, has once said, markets are good servants, they are bad masters, and they are a worse religion. Today, of course, you know, they have become a religion. It's kind of interesting. In theory, everybody understands that. Now, there's an American professor, Harvard Business School professor, his name is David, went to H. Ford Foundation back to the USA and was quite horrified about this. I said, this isn't the market economy, this is a planned economy run for the benef benefit of large corporations. So it's called when corporations rule the world. And then he wrote a second book called The Post Corporate World Life After Capitalism. And on its back cover, to my amazement, I found the following quote A hopeful signpost for the future. Klaus Schwab, founder of World Economic Forum. So I called up Corton and said, well, how come the man who organizes the greatest annual gathering of global capitalists, he gets your book about life after capitalism, and he calls it a hopeful signpost of the future. And Corton said, yeah, I was a bit surprised too. But, you know, Klaus Bart came to see me and said, Professor Corton, you're right. So Corton said, well, why don't you invite me to Davos then to speak? And Schwab replied, the world is not ready for that yet. <laughs> so, you know, you have statements by the World Economic Forum about our incapacity to solve interconnected challenges, but somehow they seem to think that we are imprisoned in this ideology. They don't seem capable of moving, moving beyond it. And even China today, of course, is basically part of this system. Now, for 5,000 years, China was able to integrate any foreign influence which came, they were able to integrate in their own system. But now, you know, they haven't just joined the World Trade Organization, other Western institutions. They are being urged now to open up their borders to you know have, uh, open up their financial markets etc and uh, you know I'm very concerned that they have been given about the kind of quality of the information they receive fortunately the World Future Council has very good links in China and we're now trying to try and rectify that there is a man Chandra Nair who's been advising the Chinese government who's you know pointing out capita can as I said, be the same in China as it is in the West. So they are listening, they understand some of these things more than here. Because I said to Nair, when he said in China, there's no human right to own a car. I said, I even read you writing that in a paper in Abu Dhabi. I said, have you ever tried to say that in the USA? He said, yes, I tried once. They called me an environmental Taliban. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do, unfortunately, because it isn't very easy, is to learn financial Latin. Because that's where the power is. Now in, a money, uh, in a world ruled by money, if you don't understand how money is created, basically you have disempowered yourself. And uh, of course, in the Middle Ages in Europe, when power was in the hands of the church, if you wanted to debate with the church about, on power, these debates were only held in Latin. And today, of course, you know, debates about power are only held in financial Latin. So in order to point to the fact that the emperor has no clothes, you have to understand you know, financial Latin. You also, of course, have to understand the very simple fact that markets, as such as they exist in the textbooks, don't exist in the real world. Whenever I hear businessmen saying that, you know, I need more market and less state, I said, so the idea for you must be no state, all market. So I said, have you considered investing in Somalia? There is no government, there is no functioning state. And, of course, they look quite, you know, quite embarrassed. The other point is cost-benefit analysis, which rule our world. Now, cost-benefit analysis, again, can you know, the bottom line, of course, depends completely on what you admit and you include in the top line. And uh, we found out, for example, in the early climate negotiations, that the economists who were advising these you know, negotiations had vast lives in poor countries like Bangladesh like Belgium, with the argument that, well, you see, those countries can't afford to pay more to cost-benefit analysis than just adapting to climate change instead of trying to stop it, because they say it's uneconomic to spend all this money trying to stop it, because most of the victims, of course, are going to be, you know, going to be in, in, in poor countries. Uh, in the World Future Council, we also started, you know, looking at another huge 
waste or miscalculation. People tell you about the, the costs of renewables being more than You can't compare the costs of, uh, fos of renewables and non-renewables because non-renewable, if you have used it, it's gone. With a renewable, it's completely different. If you haven't used it, it's gone. The sunshine you could have tapped, the wind you could have tapped yesterday, are lost forever tomorrow or today. So we started looking at what is that waste of natural capital? And you know, the other side uses that. They, you, if, you, if you close down a coal mine, they say, oh, could have run for 30 years, you have wasted all this potential coal. And they value it and they say, you've destroyed industrial capital. We said, you're destroying natural capital every day. Again, trillions of dollars, US trillions of dollars a year. How do you value it? Well, you can't really value the mine, which you haven't tapped, but you can value the fossil fuels, which you're burning unnecessarily, because they have a value for the petrochemical industry of the future, but you already burnt them instead of using them, uh, instead of saving them and using, as I said, the wind and sun to the maximum. Nobody has done those kind of calculations before, and I asked a correspondent for, an environmental correspondent for a major UK newspaper why he hadn't used the paper I'd given him, and he said, well, I haven't really understood it. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of education to do here. Now, how did I get into all this? Well, basically, I grew up in a family where we discussed problems, but I was also, we were also interested in discussing in, in solutions. You know, why are we living with problems we could solve? I'm sure there are problems we can't solve, but you know, those we can solve. Why don't we solve them? Why don't solutions get taken seriously? And how do you get taken seriously? And so, of course, in Sweden, where I grew up, if you get a Nobel Prize and suddenly you are taken seriously, you can speak on any subject and you get taken seriously. So I suggested to the Nobel Foundation, because I had actually you know, moved away from the will of Alfred Nobel and created one new award, namely the one for economics. So I said, why not one for the environment? And they discussed it and said, no, thank you, no more awards. And so then I told enough people about this who got very excited about the idea. So I thought I would my much smaller resources. You know, I dealt in rare postage stamps. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. You can imagine which of the two was most profitable. So I set up this award on a much smaller level and handed it out in Stockholm. And um, for a couple of years, we were sort of, uh, it was suggested this was something crazy. Maybe it was, this was still the time of the Cold War, a KGB or CIA plot against the Nobel Prizes. But one member of the Swedish parliament believed enough in us and convinced enough of her colleagues that after five years we were invented, invited to present this award in the Swedish parliament, you know, which we are still doing. And you know, this is not uh, small, these are not small projects. One of the award recipients uh, is Swiss, Dr. Hans Harren, in fact, um, found a natural enemy of a parasite, Mili Bilimag, which was destroying, killing the cassava root, which is basic food for hundreds of millions of Africans. And the, the conventional modern scientific uh, treatments hadn't worked. So he went back to where this cassava root came from in South America and he found this wasp, which was a, nat which was a natural enemy of this bug. And you know, they, they distributed sort of from planes, and let out millions of these wasps, and it worked. So according to uh, UN sources, he probably may have saved the lives of 20 million or more Africans from, from dying of hunger. But I realized after some years of thinking, oh well, you know, this is, they will, these solutions will move up to become the new mainstream, that that wasn't really happening. The existing structures are still too fossilized, too massive. So I asked myself, well, how do you, how do you, that, you know, we don't live in a vacuum, you know, we act on incentives. And of course, the quickest working incentive is, is the law. If something is illegal, you know, most people will, you know, will follow the law. So I said, just like you need to spread better. So this was the idea of the, the World Future Council, to basically bring in, identify good policies, which often exist somewhere, but as many parliamentarians tell us, you know, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the knowledge, we don't know about them. We started with feed-in tariffs, a very effective German law, you know, to spread renewable energies, which is now in many countries. We found they hadn't even found the German term, they hadn't even found a, an understandable translation, they called it grid injection subsidy. And so we coined the term feed-in tariffs, and we introduced this to the, the House of Commons and the former later energy minister, uh, 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 Charles Henry, said to me two years ago, I know that it was the World Future Council which first told the, the, the House of Commons about the feed-in tariffs. One Labour MP, Alan Simpson, mobilised enough of his own party to vote against this, against the then Labour government, to vote for this, to push this, uh, for this new law. They got the opposition on board and they got feed-in tariffs introduced. No they're trying to win. 
too costly, but it is by far the most effective law in spreading renewable energy. And so the, the model works. You can do that. We have held hearings in all continents, informing people, advising governments on how you introduce, how you improve law. You find a good law, someone you work to adapt it. You can't just take it verbally. You have to adapt it to the local uh, situation. We then set up an award, the first international award for best policies and laws. And we look at a different area every year. And we started this in 2009. And the theme was food security. We found that there was a region in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, which guarantees everybody that a healthy meal a day. And this law costs 2% of the city budget. It's a whole package of laws, of course, promoting local, agric local agriculture, etc. So we are now, our resources are very limited, so this has taken some years, but we now, last year brought a delegation of African mayors to Belo Horizonte to study this law and we are now going to hold, the next hearing is in Namibia, to help Namibian cities adapt this law to their, to their needs. And this of course you can do in other areas, we then moved on in a close cooperation with the UN, which was really union. So uh, the next year it was biodiversity, best law Costa Rica, uh, 2011 forest, best law Rwanda, uh, 2012 best law spread ocean and coasts. The winning policy came from the Pacific nation of Palau. And uh, last year it was best laws on disarmament. And there is a Latin American Caribbean treaty which made, uh, the, which made the whole area nuclear free, which was 50 years ago, but still very, very effective. And there are also various national laws you know, from New Zealand, from Argentina, etc., etc., collecting small arms, which we're now trying to take, to take to Bosnia. So, you know, there are always examples like that. Of what is needed is a coherent response. And so we're now trying to be gathering all these best policies and others in areas we haven't moved into yet. This year, uh, the uh, latest areas we started working on are best laws to protect the so what we are doing this is a situation where we say if these policy changes are implemented, then we are again moving in the right direction. We can say that then solutions uh, are again going to are happening faster than problems. The problems are growing. So they are basically a cornerstone, not of one future, but you know, to make sure that we again open the door to a diversity of futures. Basically, I say they are the cornerstone of a world grown up humans, because at the moment, you know, we are ruled by this very, very childish worldview that somehow uh, we go back to this uh, pre-crisis world of, you know, eternal growth. It's, as I said, you know, like a teenager who's managed to get his parents It's completely, completely immature. So how do we move forward? Well, one thing we have to learn from our opponents, the conservative, you know, defenders of privilege, they're actually very good at cooperating. Organizations work together long term. They fund, you know, their media representatives, their lobbyists, uh, do their research together. Among NGOs, even sort of businesses who claim part of the solution, the best they can come up with is a, is a joint full page ad in the Herald Tribune before an important vote in the European Parliament. While their opponents were, of course, there, personally going and visiting all the key MPs. And of course, you know, they, they, they lost the vote. So you need basically much more, uh, much more cooperation because we have fewer resources, of course, because we're not externalizing costs at the expense of future generations. And therefore, we have to use our resources, resources more, much more effectively even than they. But this is, of course, the, where the real problem comes. This comes this externalization of production costs. We've done it now for so long. Everybody agrees in theory it's a bad thing. It must be stopped. You know. um, abolish subsidies on fossil fuels. You can get people from the political right through to the political left with everybody in between. Yes, and of course, makes sense. But you know, we are sort of focus groups. Well, why does it make sense? Because basically it's unfair competition. It's fraudulent. You're pretending that you know, your product has a certain price and a certain quality because of your own skills and cleverness. In fact, you've done it because you've dumped part of the production costs onto future generations and onto the environment. But if you try, actually try to do this in practice, and you know, we, we came and our focal groups are elected parliamentarians. And the first group we presented this to were parliamentarians in Africa because we set up 
The World Future Council set up the African Renewable Energy Alliance, which has parliamentarians from many African countries. And they said to us, um, well, the problem is, if we would propose that at home, we'd face a revolution. And this isn't just theory. This is what happened in Nigeria when the president tried to abolish you know, subsidies on, on petrol. There were violent demonstrations. Same thing happened in Sudan, same thing happened in Jordan. Understandable, in Jordan, taxi drivers were saying their income had gone down by two thirds because of the rapid rise in the petrol prices, which was done for economic rather than environmental reasons. So are there ways, are there ways forward? Yes, you need an integrated approach. You know, Indonesia is moving towards it. They realize that if they raise the petrol prices so the fishermen can't go out fishing so far out anymore, then they're going to fish closer to the shore. Of course, there are less fish. They have to increase the value of that catch by making sure that the fish is processed and not, you know, not sold raw. So there are solutions, but they are quite often, as I said, you know, they are integrated solutions. And of course, quite often they need, they need new funding. So this is why we are, we are saying that you know, we need probably to start creating new money. We need to get governments again to print money. Now this, of course, is being you know, as traded as a joke. Oh, that'll cause mass inflation. But that's, again, ideological nonsense. New money against new production, against new performance, is not inflationary. If the new money funds new production, so you have a new level of money and, and, and goods, it's not inflationary. What happened in the Weimar Republic had nothing to do with that. German production had collapsed because of the war. What happened in Zimbabwe had nothing to do with that. Uh, production had collapsed because of misguided nationalization policies. But if you do it, you know, if you just fund productive capacity, especially when they have been underutilized, like we have in Europe at the moment, uh, this is actually very, very effective. This is how China was so rich for the, in the Middle Ages, because the emperor understood that. Well, here in Europe, people thought that you know, money, real wealth is only gold, which of course is scarce, so they tried alchemy, which didn't work very well, so they decided the only way to create money was through debt. So government stayed poor and in debt, people stayed poor, bankers became very rich, and that's of course you know, still the situation. You are having now a read interest in this. Roosevelt tried to do it in the 1930s, you know, never got anywhere with it, but there's a study now by staff members of the IMF about this, it was called the Chicago Plan, it's a book called the Chicago Plan, <laughs> revisited. When uh, it, this was reviewed in the Daily Telegraph in England, the reviewer said this would dethrone the bankers. Said, yes, but you know, who put them on the throne? Of course, to get this anywhere, this requires political engagement and Maybe this is a city where many are really politically engaged, but I do find quite often it's quite worrying, this kind of anti-political uh, attitude and prejudice you find in lots of people in civil society. And so I always remind them of uh, what happened in ancient Athens and the Greek democracy. Uh, the citizen who was engaged, who engaged in public political life, which doesn't mean you know lifetime political careers, but went in and out, took part in public political life, was known as a politis. The citizen who refused to get involved in public political life was known as an idiotis. Today, of course, people think you have to be an idiot to get involved in politics, but I said, unless more people do, you know, we are not actually going to be able to solve any of this problem. Now, just in conclusion, say, you know, the, the world changes daily. So this idea that, you know, well, we can't change the world, of course, you know, we can, we just don't know what role we're going to play in this, in this change. And when you, if you look back, for example, in Europe, over 20 years when the communist system collapsed and so-called ordinary citizens came around, around round tables to steer their country into the, into the future. Of course, when we have the next collapse facing us is going to be, be, be much harder because the, the future, the model is less unclear. But it's clear that a few things we need to do now, I think, quite clear. And you can find, of course, more on the website of the World Future Council. One campaign we started is to make sure that future generations have some kind of institutional representation in public political life. Because our ancestors in many parts of the world actually had that. They, in pre-colonial India, these, they were even called councils of seers into the future making sure that when day-to-day -day decisions were taken, future generations were not neglected. In, in North America, among the, the native uh, populations there, you probably heard of this term, the seventh generation principle, that every decision taken by the tribal council mm -hmm. had to be analyzed in the effects of the next seven generations to come. 
So we started this, we looked around on the national level, there are such institutions as one in, in Wales, there also was a very good one in Hungary, a parliamentary ombudsperson for future generations. Unfortunately, the current Hungarian government thought he was too influential, so they um, reduced his powers and he is now resigned. Israel had one, but he annoyed them too much, so they abolished the position after, after a few years. But we started on the, the UN level and we tried to get a UN High Commissioner for Future Generations adopted in Rio. Unfortunately today, as you know, um, you have to have consensus among all the world's 190 plus states, which is basically impossible because I can guarantee you that if USA endorses it, Cuba is going to be against it and you vice versa. So you can't get that endorsement. And the Brazilians you know, didn't want any uh, arguments like you had in Copenhagen, so anything which wasn't complete consensus, they dropped it from the final declaration. Fortunately, we had one of my colleagues was coordinating the global uh, major group youth and so she alerted them and they all went and sat down in front of the Brazilian delegation and put tapes in front of their mouths and said, you take me away our voice. And so they were sort of embarrassed into putting back into the final declaration that the UN Secretary General is being asked to study how the interest of future generations can be integrated into UN decision making. And this study uh, report came out uh, last year, last autumn, and our proposal for a high commissioner is still recommendation number one. But now, of course, uh, it, couldn't, it didn't go last year to the General Assembly because the agenda was still full, so it will now go to the high-level political group and hopefully to the General Assembly this year. But anything you can do through your contacts to so keep telling your governments, please support this proposal for UN High Commissioner for Future Generations. As I said, more on the website. Another of these various policies, many of them you'll obviously know about, you know, feed-in tariffs, monetary reform, some, I brought some papers on there, but one which when we first came out with the first version of this Global Policy Action Plan, which brought the greatest publicity, was the one asking for legally mandated eco-literacy tests for candidates for public office. <laughs> and also for graduates of business schools and of economics departments. This, I think, could be, again, something to pick up. <laughs> so another uh, point I always make is, you know, don't be afraid of entering conflicts. In one way, we need more conflict in the world, not a violent conflict, but we do need to be ready and go out there and remember that, you know, Jesus didn't negotiate with the money changes in the, in the temple, he threw them out. Sometimes that is highly necessary. And also, and the last point, don't be overwhelmed by the new media. They are very, very useful to mobilize, but as Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, writes in his latest book, after having studied the Arab Spring, he said, the people didn't occupy the Ministry of the Interior with their mobile phones. They actually had to go there and you know, take risks. And uh, last year I gave a talk at a youth conference in Berlin and uh, had a very, I had all these young people afterwards very, very interested in this work. And then this older woman came and said to me, I don't understand why they, are, they think your speech was so great. You didn't even use a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, Winston Churchill once said, in times of crisis, it is not enough to do our best. We have to do what's necessary. And I think that is the question our children and grandchildren are going to ask of us. Not, did you do your best, but did you do what's necessary? Thank you.